Hello everyone, Teresa Van Leesha, qualified teacher, 28 years. I'm going to talk more about my brilliant book, Political Persecution of Women and Children World. Um, but first, some great speeches for you to watch. It's the equivalent of mummy saying, time to put the toys away. <laughs> really, quite the tantrum. Um, oh, little pug. Oh, hello. <laughs> I know what a dog is. Um, anyway, so um, we've come to this amazing historic place, uh, mainly because Liz and Kelly threatened me. Um, uh, because there are some really organized women here who want to make a firm impact in their local area because they're very concerned about the march through the institutions um, and the, the co-opting of teachers in schools um, and even football clubs, I assume. So uh, there's, there's many women who have been raising concerns for quite some time. And one thing Let Women Speak does is we shine a big, great big light on exactly what is happening <laughs> by inviting the boys to come out. Um, and then what happens is people just drive by and they think, oh, I wonder what's happening. And then they hear that you're all a bunch of fascists. And then they think, well, hang on a minute, because I'm sure I saw Marjorie from down the road and she's very nice. <laughs> Uh, and then what they do is they look into the issue and then they find out that your council is captured, that your NHS is captured, that your schools are captured, that even, and I'm nothing against the amazing police officers are here today who've been champion, I've got to say. But even a higher up the food chain in the police force where they don't have any say, and those management, they've forgotten what it's like to walk around on the streets and see actual crime. They have all these policies in place where these lovely officers might have to call John, she, he, they, them, she, they, depending on what day it is. Uh, and they might have to ask their non-binary little staff member how they need to be, um, did someone just say she, they, queen? <laughs> all for the bants, boys. Um, but it's, it's happening in every institution and the people that do the hard work in every institution, and I met a nurse yesterday, um, but the, the people who do the hard work in every single institution are not the people pushing the policies because they're too busy thinking about how do they most effectively fight crime or how do they most effectively heal patients. So yesterday I met a nurse who had to retire um, from the NHS because during COVID, she'd gone from a grief, a, a nurse specialising in childhood grief and dealing with the families of children who pass. She had to deal with uh, lifting uh, actual patients who'd passed, adults. And she'd end up with prolapse discs. And she said that it was rampant through the NHS. And people had just forgotten to look after the frontline workers. Uh, and I think that's what's happening, certainly with the women in Darlington. That, that just saying, I'm going to do the accent, you're going to be offended, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's impossible. <laughs> I just don't want to see a penis when I'm getting changed and that. <laughs> and those women are told, let's just, well actually they're not even told much are they, they're just passive aggressive signs on the front of their changing area. Apparently not wanting to see a man's naked body or a man to see your naked body is not a good enough thing anymore for women. We've got to have some sort of overt, beyond that justification as to why we don't want to see them. And it's, it's sexual voyeurism and it, is, it used to be assault and a crime and now we've got to the point where we're the criminals for saying, I just don't want to see the penis, I don't. <laughs> A Devana, Devanama. Um, right, anyway, I'm going to stop doing the accent. I probably won't. It's been very difficult walking around, and my husband and I walking around in uh, the Metro Centre. Uh, and I remember when Metro Land was there, by the way. Um, and, um, and we're walking around, and every, every so often we're like, did you, did you hear? Like, everyone's Geordie. It's so wonderful. What a wonderful place. How wonderful this place is. Um, <coughs> So, how I normally start this is not rambling, but I'm not very well. And um, we say this, 
What a day this has been. What a rare mood I'm in. Why, it's almost like being a... Oh, well done, well done. Um, and we say these things, and, and to some people, they are, they are practically weapons of mass destruction. Um, no woman has a penis. No man has a vagina. <laughs> There's no such thing as non-binary. And transitioning children is profound abuse. And what we have here in your lovely little gathering is we have at least three candidates uh, from the last general election who stood for Party of Women, which I'm just... And I was... Look, it's, it's the first outing we ever got. And we know we weren't going to win. I mean, I'm no Margaret Thatcher, um, <coughs> despite the accusations. Um, but... We knew we weren't going to win, but we did want to have these conversations and we did want to say these words in places where we knew we previously could not. We, the reason we meet in such a, a beautiful places such as this park today is because we know that venues can't be trusted to actually hold, keep their hand, end of the bargain and let us have spaces to speak. That's why we came out into the open air uh, where they can... So we, we meet in public and the idea is... That every woman who's ever wanted to speak about this, and maybe she feels powerless in her own home, maybe her teenagers are tyrants, uh, maybe she doesn't feel that she can speak at work, uh, maybe she feels that every time she tries to speak up for women's rights, because men have already co-opted the environment and they've already put themselves in the women's toilets, women have to come back from a position of defence and say, we don't want them in there, and it becomes a really difficult path. Rather than being consulted where we can happily say no, there is this retrospective thing where we are just assumed we give our consent to men in our spaces, and we don't. Uh, and so this is the place where some women find their courage to begin saying a word that they mean. It's just very short, and the word is no, and it doesn't require any more explanation than that. Do you want a man in your space? No. no. <laughs> That's it. And then that's the end of the conversation. It's a bit like, do you want cherry bakewell with your tea? No, I don't. No, not, no, I'm on a diet. No, I don't particularly like almonds. You just say no. Uh, and so I, I just hope that what this does is it just plants a bit of a foundation for some of you that feel that you haven't been able to say it or that you don't know that anyone else would also say it, giving you some strength in numbers that actually there's bloody loads of women, some of us menopausal, um, where no is really quite a useful word and we say it with far less care than we used to. Um, but many of us have also had children and so we're also used to saying no and meaning it. And I think these children over there just haven't heard it often enough. So we'll just be saying it a bit more. Okay, who would like to speak? You all right? You'll be great, you'll be great. Is it everyone can hear you. Can they? Yeah. Yeah, everyone can hear you. It's not like a Sheffield, but it's just great. But wow, there's a lot of you. I'm going to speak nice and close to the mic. Thank you. I grew up in Morpeth a long time ago, and that's one of my reasons for speaking today. The other reason I wanted to speak today is because Emily Davison is a hero to me. So you're Thank you. It was when I was growing up in the 70s that I first heard of Emily Davison. Her grave is in, in the cemetery, which is a very short walk from where I used to live. It's, it's just over there. Debbie Harry was in the charts. Jane Fonda was establishing herself as a serious actress and a political activist. Margaret Thatcher was about to walk into number 10 Downing Street. It seemed to me that although women 
were still oppressed in many ways, we seemed to be running the show. And then to discover that less than 50 years before that time, we didn't even have the right to vote, it totally blew my mind. And that is when I became a feminist. So who is Emily Davison? Who, who was Emily Davison? Well, Emily was born in London, Blackheath, on the 11th of October, um, 1872. So it was a birthday a couple of days ago. Happy birthday, Emily! Emily was given an education, which was very rare for women in those days, and she gained a degree, a first-class honours degree from Oxford University. But she never graduated. Why didn't she graduate? Because women were not allowed to have degrees, only men were permitted to have degrees. It was when she was teaching that she met the most renowned suffragette of all times, Emily Pankhurst. And she joined the, the Women's Political and Social Union, founded by Emmeline Pankhurst, to organise the fight for women to get the vote. So what did they do? Well, they'd already written to MPs, they'd had meetings, polite parades, demonstrations. Did the MPs listen? No, they didn't. They just ignored them. So they were forced to take more dramatic action in order to get noticed. They threw stones. They chained themselves to government buildings. They smashed the windows of government buildings. They set fire to post boxes. They even slashed a painting. Did they get noticed? No, they didn't. They were imprisoned. They were arrested. They were sent to jail where they went on hunger strike. They refused to eat and they were held down and forced fed. They had tubes rammed down their throats. They sustained life-changing injuries from that horrendous ordeal. Emily was imprisoned eight times and she was force-fed 49 times. Yeah. <laughs> Emily, in 1913, attended the well-known Derby horse race held at Epsom Racecourse and she took with her a scarf, probably <laughs> similar to the one I'm wearing in, in suffragette colours. She hoped to throw the scarf over the neck of the king's horse as it came past, a horse called Amna. But instead, she was struck and she sustained very serious injuries, which she died from four days later. And guess what? They brought her back to Morpeth. I know some of you ladies travel by train today. Well, that's where Emily arrived back in Morpeth, because Morpeth was her family's hometown. And that was the start of her funeral procession. What is very sad is that Emily never lived long enough to see women vote because it wasn't until 15 years after her death that we finally got the vote, that everyone got the vote on equal terms to men in 1928. Emily was one of many women of the era of the era who had a formidable fight on their hands and they fought that fight they faced that fight with boldness unimaginable courage
and determination. And Emily should be a tribute, not just to women, but to everyone to stand up for what is right. So where are we now? It's nearly a hundred years since we got the vote. Where, where are we? Things have moved on significantly. The Second World War transformed the way women were viewed because suddenly we were having to do the men's jobs. And guess what? We did them, eat, we did them every bit as good as the men. The 1970s saw the introduction of the Sex Discrimination Act and the Equal Pay Act, which were designed to improve women's position in employment and in the labour market. But despite all of this, life for women seems to be getting more and more ridiculous. The adversity, instead of easing, is worse. We have the age-old problems of the gender pay gap, of sexual violence. And more recently, we now have men who claim to be us being allowed in female-only hospital wards, prisons, toilets, changing rooms. Men's sports, women, sorry, women's sports are being given away to mediocre men who claim to be us. They're taking on medals. Our language is being erased. The NHS is calling us chest feeders. Um, they're, they're calling us ch chest feeders, menstruators, birthing persons. It's utterly dehumanising. And now we're being silenced. We're not allowed to talk about this. Because if we do, we're ostracised, sacked, even arrested. And it seems to be permissible for us to be screamed at, intimidated, called Nazis, called fascists. If Emily and the suffragettes were still alive today, I wonder what they would be fighting for. Because we seem to have a bigger fight than ever before. We are losing our rights everywhere. We women and girls must wake up to the way history is going. And remember how fragile and hard fought our rights are and how easy they are to lose. We must stand together against the erosion of our rights. We are connected. We are not a so-called gender. We are the female sex. We must be bold, courageous and determined. Just like Emily and that pioneering group of women who got us the vote not that long ago. Just ordinary women who stopped at nothing to get their voices heard. Let's keep the spirit of the suffragettes alive. Can I share a quote from Emmeline Pankhurst, which I think has particular resonance to us? We women are roused. Now that we are roused, we will never be quiet again. Now, what, was she, what she was saying when she said that, what she was saying was that when women get stirred up and when they get angered and that when they get determined, there's no stopping them. Heaven and earth cannot stop them. They will be heard. Can you see the parallel? Let women speak. 
We will speak. We will be heard. We women are roused. Now we are roused, we will never be quiet again. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Teresa Van Leeshout. I'm a qualified teacher, 28 years, and uh, I worked in schools in Western Australia as a high school teacher for 20, uh, 20 years. And um, what they're doing with this, uh, what I call the gender abomination, like women can't even speak properly in public now because all this instruction that people, they just don't want women to speak. Well, when I worked in the school system as a high school teacher, I taught physical education and the health education and social science education. And I also go in federal elections as well. So all the media people know who I am and all the political and government people know who I am. So as a phys ed teacher, as an experienced phys ed teacher, when I see men going in women's sports and boys going in uh, girls' sports, it's just absolutely disgusting. And as a phys ed teacher, I can tell you, not only is it not fair, it's very dangerous to do that, to allow men, biological men, in uh, women's sports, and uh, boys in girl sports, and it's really fraud what they're doing. What these men are doing going into women's spaces like women's prisons, in sports, and destroying our language and all this sort of thing. And it's really fraud, and these men that are doing it, they should be prosecuted for fraud, because it's actually really criminal what they're doing, do you know what I mean? And even, and even what the politicians are doing, all these gender politicians throughout Australia, you know, there's a whole bunch of politicians who've tried to get inquiries into the gender affirming butchery and mutilation going on of small, innocent, defenceless children. And uh, in South Australia, they tried to get an inquiry and the politicians doing it, they blocked it. Uh, in the federal Senate, Pauline Hanson tried to get an inquiry. Massive amount of time and research is trying to get an inquiry. And the politicians doing it, they blocked it. And we know more redeeming in, in uh, Victoria tried to get an inquiry and the politicians blocked it. So in South Australia, Greg Donnelly in New South Wales, he tried to get a parliamentary inquiry as well. And the politicians doing it, they all blocked it. So they don't want people talking about it. They put it in the law. It's all politically legislated and funded all over the world, not just Australia. And it's really criminal what they're doing. They need to be removed from the parliament, really. And they need to be jailed for what they're doing. Because if you uh, genital mutilate and sexualize children in the curriculum and books and all this sort of thing, it's just an abomination. And it's really evil and disgusting what they do to children and women now throughout the world. And I'm writing a really big, big book at the moment. It's 95% finished. It's about 450 pages. And it's all about the world's women's rights and the rights of the world's children as well. Do you know, it's gonna be printed next June. It's 450 pages and I'm having difficulty finishing it because I've got so much evidence, so much evidence. It's got all these issues that affect women and children and good men as well. There's a lot of good men speaking out against these abuses against women and children all over the world as well. So I've got chapters on the sex slave trade and prostitution and uh, pornography and how it affects women and children. And also rape at, on a global level is really terrorism towards women and children. When you have a look at the statistics and the data and the prevalence all over the world and uh, minimum marriage age and uh, age of consent laws and the rape statistics and child marriage statistics and laws, it's really shocking and terrible the way women and children get treated in this world. Also, I'll just, I won't go much longer because the other women want to speak and all the women here and people here, you're all brilliant. You're all absolutely brilliant. All the women and men here supporting the women today and you should all be politicians. You really should be politicians in Victoria and women like you and men like you should be politicians across Australia and across the world because because you know what's going on and you know you can see the evil being done and the bad things being done to women and children and it's just not on, it's got to be stopped. You know, with these surgeries, I've got a massive, massive chapter on gender ideology in my book 
and I've gone through all these surgeries and you know in Australia there's 35 gender surgeons, do you know that? There's only 35 and I publicly named all of them in my book because it's all, it's all public information and it's all public on government websites and private websites, you know, and um, nine out of 35 of these gender surgeons, they specialise in facial feminisation, but 26 out of 35 so gender surgeons, they do all the, what they call top surgery and bottom surgery and all that, and they even call it that. They give it these slang names, but the top surgery is bilateral mastectomy and they call it top surgery. And 85% of those gender surgeons who specialise in that, 85% of them are men. So they're cutting off the breasts of girls and women, and I believe that's just a massive attack on women and girls to be doing that surgically. And those gender surgeons, they should be jailed. It's crimes yes. against humanity. Yes. It's crimes yes. against humanity. It's massive child abuse. And all the politicians doing it, and the, and the judges supporting it in the courts as well, and all this shocking stuff going on. And a lot of it, 95%, is really coming from the government people. So I'll tell you what, if I was in charge of this country, and really I should be the Governor General of this country under God Almighty, and I would shut this down in about th three months. I would shut this all down in about three months. And you know what, in my book I listed a big long list, a big long list of children's books. If you Google children's books, transgender children's books, a baby to year seven, it comes up with over 50 books of children being sexualized and in the books and it's all, uh, you know, you can be a boy or a girl or whatever, it's all rubbish. And all those books, what the police should do is get hold of all the authors of those books and charge them with child sexual abuse material. That's what they should be charged with. And get all these books and remove them from the schools and remove them from the libraries and remove them from uh, public information because these books are criminal. It's really bad to do this to children and everybody in the world that's got morals and values and considers themselves a good person knows and understands this. So God bless you and uh, keep fighting for the rights of women and children and good men in this world as well, across the world. Be strong and brave and keep going. Never give up, never ever give up, never give up. She has power of the female written on her hoodie. The excellent thing about my book, in addition to all the massive research evidence of real life evidence all over the world and in Australia, the excellent benefit is that it has a lot of uh, answers and solutions to the problems that face women and children and good men in Australia and around the world and that's what we need. We need answers and solutions. If you don't get the answer and solution to problems, how can you solve the problem? How can you stop the abuse and the, and the violence and the corruption. So we need the right answers and the right solutions and a lot of people talk and talk and talk uh, but they don't provide the right answers and solutions and that's why these abuses and violence and corruption towards um, women, children and good men, it continues and it goes on and on because we need to get the right people in power who have got the solutions and answers to stop these abuses. I think my book is a very important book for uh, Australia and this world. If everyone in Australia read my book, the, our nation would be a million times better than what it is. My book is really like a, um, it's like an investment because uh, it's an investment in the world, in the lives of four billion women and over two billion children. I've written the book for good men as well. So there's a lot of men who've already bought my book actually. There's lots of topics in the book and issues in the, covered in the book with global research evidence and real life evidence globally and in Australia. A book like this, if you get it in a university, uh, it costs $100 to $150 uh, with all the research evidence and I sell it for $39 Australian dollars and a plus postage and also there's an e-book version for uh, people in other nations as well. So. The paperback version is just for Australians. It's to inspire the Australian people 
it's really a book investing in the lives of the world's women and children and good men. So it's an excellent book. It also makes an excellent birthday present or Christmas present. If you get two or more books, you get a 10% discount. You're not going to read a better book on women's rights and children's rights anywhere in the world, I don't think, with the amount of research evidence and real life evidence in the book globally. I've quoted people all over the world in the book and um, in Australia as well. So if you want to get the book, email me, treesalegend at hotmail.com or treesofanalicia at gmail.com or if you're in Australia, you can phone me and um, talk to me on the phone and get the book. Thanks.